one and what's up everyone we're live welcome to purple pod this is just a men's improvement panel discussion today with my homie uh chris shepherd my man how are you doing today bro good man glad to be here yeah good to see you and your setup dude it's no pretty thanks. awesome thank you man but everybody that's coming in you know right here from the start please make sure to like the video on y'all's way in uh subscribe to the channel turn your notification bell on because they keep turning me off because they keep trying to cancel me fuck you youtube um follow us on the podcast instagram though and then uh check us out live on facebook twitch twitter rumble and youtube all at the same time right now go sign up for my new coaching if you're a guy that needs help in dating uh personally if you want to show support you can go to our patreon right now or you can show support also by hitting the join button right here on the youtube channel you'll get some really cool emojis for the show too when you become a member so you use on the live chat um make sure to check out the merch store and if you want to listen to us on any audio platforms you can check me out on every single audio platform uh for streaming uh for the audio streaming make sure to add the instagram right now though please because i need to grow that account any guys that need media marketing right now any other youtubers please hit me up i'm doing a really good package right now for three clips a day and three shorts a day for only 500 dollars a month to grow your youtube channel um it's working out really great with everybody else that i'm doing um if you need any help please please hit me up for that uh shout out to just me being producer today we don't have a producer guys so no donnie in the house um but yeah Thank you so much for coming, dude. Um, just to start off, let's just uh, talk about our history. Guys, this is one of my homies from like a really long time ago. We're talking about a mentor that was a mentor before I knew what a mentor was. You know, like uh, I was probably 12 years old when I first met you um, at the Oaks Fellowship. And uh, how, I rem- how old are you now? I'm 32 now. 32. Okay. Yeah. So, so 20, 20 years, 20 years ago, though. Dude, yeah, 20 years. It's weird being able to say that. I know, dude. It's really weird. I feel old as fuck saying 20 years right Same. now. Um, but yeah, like I, I did, I remember looking up to you so much at, at the church cause you're one of the most athletic guys there. You're like, I mean, like all, like everybody looked up to you. You're just like, you, you know, like you were the perfect, like guy, like you had like the life, like you were an attractive dude, like all the girls hung out around you. Like you were just, you were a cool man and you're super loving. And just like, I mean, everything about that church was something like we were talking about before the show, you know, yeah. like how different life is now. And you know, like that whole church, everybody was just so loving. It was just a whole different atmosphere than what every every other church and everywhere else I've been in the world today. It's never been like that time, you know, and like yeah. I love how you were a part of that, you know. So thank you for always being a mentor and a part of my life, bro. I can't say thank you. Well, enough. dude, it's it's mutual, man. Like that, uh, you know, we just talking about the, the relationships that came from that community and the mentorship that we got. And it wasn't even I mean, because it wasn't this was like not just a traditional church. Like this was a church where they like took mentorship and leadership and uh, like high level stuff seriously. And they broke it down. Like some of those, those summer things we went through and, um, you know, volunteering, all that stuff. I mean, they, I mean, so much of my life and the success, even that I've had in life and other stuff, I, I learned from that season, you know, being like, like the people, serving. So. Well, I think it was the yeah. serving that was so in, intense that we, like, we were always so, uh, so about, you know, serving as much as possible for treasures in yeah. heaven. And like, I, and that's, it's it's made it to where every level in my life I'm willing to serve and give way more than my peers or anyone else around me. It yeah. seems like, yeah. and it was all started there though. Hundred percent, man. Hundred percent. And they just did everything excellent. Like most churches, like I I went to a, a different church prior to seven there and going to that you know to that that church, um, and I, you know, the environment and the culture of that place wasn't very cool. You know what I mean? Like I wouldn't take my cool friends from school and bring them to church with me, but seven, it didn't matter who you were. Like the coolest kids were like, Hey, come check out what we're doing. Cause this is awesome. And so it made, you know, the, the excellence and the quality of everything that they did, like, um, made it, made it incredible. So that, that is something that in my life I've tried to carry forward being like, Hey, if we do a good job and we make things quality, you know, yeah, it's, it's going to do a lot. So another analogy that I like to use, I don't use it on my show that often anymore, but um, remember back, you know, for, for seven, we would have um, one night. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. it was, you know, the big thing, you'd bring a friend and we'd have rock climbing, you know, dodgeball, all car the fun, smash. car <laughs> smashing, you know, just all the fun, crazy stuff. Just, yeah. just to let's get as many kids into the door to just want to have fun. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, at the end, you know, like we're going to have like this, like the spiritual night where we have the service and more kids are going to get saved on this night more than ever. And, yeah. and there's going to be more return kids ever, you know, from doing this. And a lot of my show is based around one night. Yeah, It is all based around it. So what I believe is that what's going on is right now, and I got this analogy from a guy named Hafiz, who's a really big uh, Christian speaker in Dallas, actually. And he said what's wrong with like the red pill spaces online is that 
they're putting out all this juice but no robitussin no medicine like they have all this juice like like all this all this uh, fruit punch you know to to make the kids all this sugar to make them happy and make the kids you know all these clicks because we were making women mad and kicking women off doing all this crazy stuff it's great juice it's great entertainment it's great for clicks but there's no healing there's no um there's no prescription with it or anything right. And um, and I agreed with him and what and what he was saying, what he was like is we need more more Robitussin and less and less juice. And, and I disagree with him. And what I think is like for someone like me who's just starting, I need maximum juice right now. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to put out as much juice as possible. And this is just what exactly what Andrew Tate did as well. He put out so much juice, so much crazy, stupid shit to get his name so big that he was Googled more than any other man on the planet, more than Donald Trump, anybody. To the point where everybody knew about him, and then he apologized, and he pulled back, and he changed his whole tone, and he said, you know, I'm, I, I shouldn't say these things because of this, and I shouldn't do that. He was able to start pushing the Robitussin now. Mm. You, you're able to, like, you have to use juice to get up to a certain point, and then you can switch to healing the people. Mm. And that's what I learned from one night. And if I, ever, if I, if I want to change people, if I truly want to move people to Christ in the way that I see to do it, you know, to move people to God, how, how I, I see it, it, it should be, I need to get to a high enough level to where I can impact a million people yeah. because I can't impact a million people with um, just selling nothing but medicine all the way up to that point. Yeah. You got to put a lot of juice and then you give them all the medicine at the end. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of spiritual leaders that have done this throughout all of history that have gone in through the trenches and done a lot of bad things. And then, and then at the end of all of it, they come and say, Hey, this is the truth. This is the light. You know, yeah. this is uh, the, what I did was darkness kind of, you know. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense, man. But yeah, I, I really believe that that was the coolest part about the church was that they would they were willing to do those type of things to get as many kids in the door to change as many lives as possible, yeah. no matter how different it was from everybody else. Yeah. Who cares what everybody thinks? <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was special, man. I mean, there were so many like I've I've taken so many lessons from all of that from one night to the the just the way they were excellent in every part of the service. Like there's just, man, it was awesome. Like the, the reach that they had in the little bitty town, you know, like yeah. a little bitty, little bitty County and a little bitty town. Like they, we were the biggest show in town, you know, yeah. it was, it it's was really, it's really crazy. And then how good we would do at like fine arts and stuff. I never thought about how much there was leadership in there, but yeah, we were yeah. pretty, we did have some pretty intense leadership and that's yeah. what made us that way. Well, they, they are say when it comes to leadership and this is, and I've studied leadership a lot in my life just because of business and other things and stuff. But anytime you see whether it's a church growing, a business growing in any operation growing, you can show me a leader at work. There's leaders in work, you know? And mm -hmm. so you know, it, Seven was a great example of that. They had a team of leaders that were really, really serious about the vision that they had. And then, you know, the leadership dictates the vision and the vision and the culture kind of carry the organization, you know, and so. So I got, I stopped going when I was like 15 or 16. I don't know when, when you stopped going, but kind of like what happened after that? Like, when did you leave? Um, It was uh, I think probably early when I was like early 20s somewhere in there because you know the the pastors that were there they left they had a change of leadership and then they just kind of went into this season of like rebranding themselves and so and the ever did everything feel like it changed like the yeah, people and for every, sure i for feel sure. like when a pastor changes it changes the whole vibe of a church yeah. can it not it's, especially like somebody as dominant as those pastors were I because mean, like were, that we we're talking about dan i'm, ta I'm guessing yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah and so when when dan left and then the other staff you know left i mean it was the, it was like the family left everything, you know, everything kind of like was like, well, we're gonna have to rebuild everything because they really were the heart and soul of all of it, you know? Yeah, I so. could definitely see that. Uh, so like for me personally, man, uh, the reason why I left the church was because I went on a personal kick the opposite direction and became like a super atheist and all this stupid shit. Yeah, I had to go find myself. It took me years. <laughs> um, but like it's part of growing up, right? Yeah. But like what what did uh like, did, did you, what did you do? Did you, um, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure like you always kind of stayed on your path to stay going to church. Like, where did you go after that? Did you stay going to the Oaks? Like, when did you ever leave the Oaks? Uh, whenever, uh, my first wife, Liz, her dad was a pastor at the church, you know, he was on staff there. And mm -hmm. so when they left, it's kind of when we also, we, cause we had moved up to doubt in like North Dallas, our business was up here. And so that's kind of when we, you know, and we still have so many relationships there and people and I'll go down and say, yeah, I still talk to all of them on Facebook. So, yeah. yeah. But I mean, right around that time, you know, yeah. so we moved and just life, 
life oh. progresses. Yeah, no, I feel that. Um, so I also want to ask you, man, about, you know, like what you do. Um, guys, he's probably going to be like, uh, he might end up becoming a mentor for my program soon. So if that does happen, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what he's going to be teaching. Um, you know, it's probably going to be a lot of sales and life insurance, stuff like that. Why don't you kind of go into um, like what you do and, and uh, what makes you so good at it? Yeah, well, um, well, I uh, first of all, just kind of tell you how I got there. So actually at the Oaks. Uh, there at the church, I met a guy named uh, Josh Huffman who has like 28 financial services agencies and made like seven figures passively and just had this awesome life. And I kind of grew up lower income. And so I was, you know, hungry. I was always hustling. I've been working since I was 14, you know, doing businesses or side jobs or just whatever. And I uh, got myself in this situation where I was like working on, you know, a bunch and feeling like, man, I'm working really hard, but I think there's more to it than this. Like I, I've got to, I've got to figure stuff out. And I've always had this philosophy of like, I don't have to figure things out my, by myself. That's, you know, they say experience is the best teacher, but it, you know, it has the highest tuition. Yeah. Right. And it takes the longest. And yeah. so, you know, so for me, I was like, look, I'm going to go like, and so I really started seeking out like people that had you know, we're in places in life that I wasn't yet and just getting advice and input, like even us in our conversations, like, I mean, you obviously are a pro at what you do and all this stuff. And I'm, you know, kind of breaking into this space and getting there. So in my mind, I'm like, well, I can either go down the same path that Sergio did and figure out all this stuff and learn the long way and the hard way, or I can go to Sergio and he can expedite my process. Right. And so yeah. anyways, I just got connected with him. Uh, through that and just started learning. I got my licenses uh, in financial services for insurance, securities, all that. I didn't really care about financial services. I cared about the outcome, you know, and mm -hmm. I saw his life. And so I really, like, it didn't matter what I was doing. I wanted to. You just know, wanted his I just, life. I just wanted that outcome, you yeah. know, and that platform and the influence and the money and all that stuff. And so, um, you know, and so I just started learning. So I just started learning that. Uh, ended up getting my own office and my own agency when I was like, I don't know, 24, 25, somewhere in there. First time I started making six figure income. And that's uh, crazy for that age too. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was just, you know, being able to be around good people and good leaders, you know? And, uh, since then, um, I have, uh, we've opened up 10 other agencies and, you know, my, my kind of goal and mission right now is just helping people, you know, that are, that are looking and kind of where I was that are hungry and looking and willing to put in the work, um, get their own thing going, get passive income going in their life. And then, um, teach them also not only like, you know, how to have a basis, like a basic business understanding, but also what to do with their money. Cause your money can set you free also, you mm -hmm. know, you know what to do with your money and then ultimately getting freedom. Cause for me, dude, I'm, I'm definitely money motivated. I got big goals. I got big dreams. I want to set my family up. I want to impact the world. I want to do all those things, but I am very much freedom motivated. I want to be free. And yeah. then, you know, once I'm free kind of, kind of mentality, and then I'll continue to work, but I work when I want to and how I want to. I don't mind working hard. I just want to work hard on my own schedule and on my own time and, you know, prioritize my family and my wife and my kids and all that stuff. And uh, but uh, but definitely just being free, because in my opinion, so many people are living, you know, a life where their whole life revolves around their job. Mm -hmm. You know, and if they if they still have the money problem going on in their life, they're they're kind of like enslaved to the money problem. You yeah. know? And, you know, a lot of times people, too, will say, uh, you know, I got, I got criticized a lot early on because I, I stopped doing my stuff at church. I stopped, you know, showing up to all the extra birthday parties in the family and all those things like that because I was so locked in in that season of life. I got criticized a lot for being all about the money. And in my in my mind, I was like, no, it's not. It's not about that. It's like my whole life is about money because I don't have any money. You know, yeah. like growing up when the car would break down and be sitting in the driveway for six months and we needed it. You know, the reason we didn't get the car fixed was not because we didn't need the car. We needed the car. What was the reason we couldn't get it fixed? We didn't have the money. Yeah. And so when you're poor, your whole life is about the money. Yeah. When you have money, you realize you don't even think about money, you yeah. know, and it's like, what do we need? Do we need a new car? Oh, you need mom. Mom needs this. Let's do this. It just becomes about life in, in that. And so anyways, it's just, you know, I guess didn't mean to rabbit trail though, but mainly just like helping people solve money problems, you know, and financial literacy free. today is gone, gone, man. Nobody has it. Yeah. And on top of that, there's so much misinformation. I mean, there's misinformation oh, about yeah. everything, but I mean, you mentioned life insurance a second. There's so much like misinformation on life insurance or investing in policies and all these things. And it's like, 
you know, understanding the difference between term and you yeah. know, and like all the different kinds, infinite and, banking, all yeah, and stuff. like and which ones really the better ones, and what everybody else is trying yeah. to sell you versus what you're, you know, like people really don't ever sit down for the conversation yeah. just to learn the facts behind the things, right. you know. And some of the be- some of the best advice, especially when it comes to life insurance, is just sitting there and laying out the policies and go, let's just start here. How much do you get paid if I buy this one? How much do you get paid if I buy this one? Mm-hmm. How much do you get paid if I buy that one? All right. So yeah. just that mean it's going to change my decision. I just want to know. Yeah. And what you'll realize is when you realize what people are paid to, you know, for some of these policies that are ridiculous, you know, mm-hmm. and they're terrible investments and things like that. Like, you know, you go, oh, I see why it's it's hard. Yeah. It's hard for you to accept that this probably isn't the best thing, you know. Yes. So, it just depends how how much how scummy like the company is really because there's yeah. some that are more scummy than others and they're going to do things that they can get away with just to make the the yeah. extra the extra money you know yeah. and like but that's why like that's why like we're talking about financial literacy is more important today mm-hmm. than ever because if you if you don't have somebody who's telling you the truth yeah. like somebody who you can trust it's just i think that's the hardest thing today is in today's marketing yeah. like look at ads how how quickly they're just designed for us and stuff like yeah everybody is getting finessed and in, in, in just in every aspect of life and everything, you know, like mm-hmm. it, it's so hard not to, I think that's another thing I talk about on the show all the time is just how to not get finessed, how to not get scammed. Like I'm so against yeah. that. And, um, and it's all about trust. And these people are going to these charlatans and all these different people online and they're putting all their trust in these crypto bros or just, you know, yeah. like all types of crazy stuff. And it's like, Guys, y'all aren't watching the Fed. Like you need yeah. to be watching. There's other things you should be watching right oh, now man. to know what's gonna. You need to check the interest rates. Like like y'all aren't yeah. looking at. Y'all are expecting these guys to tell you everything when they're gonna put a lot of fluff in. When you pay for their thousand dollar or five thousand dollar program, they're gonna put a lot of fluff in there so you don't feel screwed. But really, that's the five or ten percent that you need to pay attention to, yeah. not all the fluff. And that's what that's what bothers me the most about the people online that are trying to do the financial stuff or trying to have fi- teach people fi- financial literacy because they don't realize that they're they're getting scammed based off of just the whole system like how it's designed the whole system is designed to make the customer happy and stuff and that's right. what makes y'all end up screwed in the end mm-hmm. is they're just trying to make y'all happy but it ends up screwing y'all over yeah it's like you actually need to be dead ass honest with them and just tell yeah. them the things they probably don't want to hear at the moment no, you know but it's the truth 100%. <laughs> um i also want to know you know when, when it comes to uh life insurance and investing and stuff like that would you say that that there's like a specific route you know if you could just give out some sauce right now for anybody watching Mm -hmm. like a specific route on on life insurance that everybody should all like the difference between term and stuff like that Mm -hmm. is there like one way that people should always go kind of that you would say yeah absolutely so so i'll start with this just big picture here and and it's because it's really not that complicated like you got to understand like you know, insurance and investments are two different things. Like what, you know, what is the purpose of life insurance? Like if I pass away and I have, there are people in my life that are dependent on me financially, maybe my kids, I pay their bills and feed them. My wife, you know, the, my, maybe my parents, you know, the, the, the different people that I, pro, I provide for, mm-hmm. right? If all of a sudden I'm gone, what also disappears? My income, right? Mm-hmm. My income, which they are also living off of and I'm supporting they're them dependent with. on you. And so that's the whole purpose of life insurance is it protects your income for the people that are dependent on you financially. Right. And so, you know, that's, it's not necessarily meant to be an investment because there's much better investment vehicles out there with way less fees, way less restrictions and all that. And so, See, and that's why I liked about y'all was yeah. because y'all kept it separate, but what about these life insurance companies that say it's an investment vehicle? Yeah. Like, cause there's a lot of them that are oh, doing yeah. this too. And they'll, 100%. and they'll tell you that, that like, you know, if you get this term policy mm-hmm. or whatever, like it's an investment vehicle, you can take the money out, you can reuse yeah. it, you know, all those type of things. Like, like, would you say that they're, they shouldn't be saying that? Like, is that wrong? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I really You're against that. those, yes. those insurance companies when yeah. they say stuff like that? hundred, one hundred 100%. Dude, I love 100%. hearing stuff like this. Please tell me yes. why. Like, I no. love hearing so like a why. Couple, there's a couple of fundamentals. So they, and they're really, they're really deceptive about it and they make stupid amounts of money off of these policies. Yeah, like no, yeah. Amounts. Like, um, so here's here's a couple things. One, you have to borrow your own money out of the policy. So a lot of they they kind of confuse you. They go, hey, if you buy this five hundred thousand dollar IUL or whatever this this policy is, you know, you can then be your own bank. You can leverage the re- leverage the policy. So the the illusion is that I can leverage five hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and that is not true because the actual value in the policy is a separate account that you have to accumulate over years and then borrow it. Yeah, so maybe five grand after five years, or maybe, yeah, yeah, right. It'd be the same, but but the the the, the ridiculous part of it is that you're borrowing your own money, 
paying the insurance company fees to borrow your own money. So yeah. it'd be like you go into a bank, open a savings account, and you start saving $500 a month in it. Two years later, you go, hey, I need $3,000 out of my account. They go, absolutely. And then you take it out and they go, we're just going to charge your account 8% until you return that $3,000. That's so ridiculous. Back into your savings account. <laughs> Oh, man. Isn't that the silliest thing in the world? It's so dumb. But they, it's not pitched that way. It's not sold that way. They say, it's well, you got to structure it properly or, the, you know, all this BS. And it's like, no, bring a contract to the table and let's go through that contract, mm -hmm. you know? And so, it, it, like, it's, it's... And you see this all day because all day. You be, because because people come and redo, like, like, like their oh, policies yeah. through you, right? And see, and I love how y'all do it because you keep it separate. You do the yeah. investments one way and you... And this is my biggest thing that I teach you because I'm huge on 401ks, IRAs, and HSAs and maxing them out and, and yeah. how it's seven times what it's going to be now yeah. when we retire and how when we retire right now, the, they're already showing we're going to need $3.5 million oh, yeah. for our for our generation. Like, yeah. and it, the only way to have that is by having at least like, I think it's yeah. like 14 or 15,000 minimum a year right now or something oh, yeah. like it's crazy. And a lot of people don't look at it that way, but you need to keep it separate and do yeah. it that way. And I, I argue against life insurance guys a lot, but sometimes like I just let them stay happy when, whenever they disagree with me on like keeping it separate, you yeah. know? Well, the, the, the best investment vehicles are not an insurance policy. Like, mm -hmm. let me ask you a question. You have auto insurance. Yeah. You, do you have an investment vehicle attached to your auto insurance? <laughs> no. You have homeowner's insurance. Well, why do you have an investment vehicle attached to no. your homeowner's insurance? Yeah. So why your life insurance? Yeah. The best investment vehicles are not insurance policies. They're investment vehicles. They have their own space. The thing is, back in the day, insurance companies figured out, hey, if we add this, like, thing or figure out how to make it where the, it can be a permanent policy or these other deals, we can charge a lot more premium. You know, and so they just start getting real tricky and they use things like, you know, this. Well, would you rather rent your policy or own it? You know, mm, would you yeah, rather, no, I've heard that a thousand equity times. Equity up in your policy and all these things. And it's, I've heard that so those much are lately. Little, those are those statements in and of themselves are logical truths, but they're not translated in reality to the policy. You know, and so it's, you, you know, they're comparing apples and oranges. You know, it's like yeah. it's not the same thing. And so but they make stupid amounts of money off of them. The number one commissioned product in all the financial services is cash value life insurance. I didn't, I didn't know that. That Yeah. 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 That's really crazy. Yeah. Um, what was I just thinking? That was really that I was just thinking about when it comes to the insurance thing. Um, whatever, like they say, like you can you, you can take the money out later on, you know, from, from your policy. Um, like they're like one of the big things they also say is like, if you're trying to start a business or anything in your future, this is the best thing to do because you could do it this way. Well, like what I would say is like, and, and I'm just playing devil's advocate here because I don't have life insurance. Like I, I actually go the 401k, like I want to be self-insured. So I go the, the other route, but like they would say to me, well, if I want to take out of my IRA or anything, I'm going to get a 10%, you know, withdrawal penalty or something like that. Like what's a, what's a good debate against that? I guess you could say, well, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of like allowances with like qualified in investment money that you can that you can do maybe like first time home buyer there's all kinds of mm, different things like yeah, that true. that you can do that that are a way better route and it's kind of like the i don't i don't know what this uh it's the it's the gaps theory right so the gaps is basically like this just because like you know whatever your maybe your ira doesn't have an answer for it it doesn't automatically default to will cash value you know what I'm saying? It's mm -hmm. like, no, just because IRAs may not be the best thing to leverage for your business, it doesn't mean it doesn't default to then cash value is the answer. Does that make yeah. sense? It means maybe there's another answer, you know? And so, but, you know, they do a lot of that stuff where it's like, it's still a, a compromised contract. Like when you really understand, I've never one time in the 16 years I've been doing this and the hundreds and hundreds of people I've gone through this route, when I, we go through the actual contract that they have, there has not been one person that's ever bought it, having completely understood it and, and still wanted it. <laughs> yeah. Once we explain it, they're either pissed or mad or sad, you know? Yeah, like, because they learned that they were getting famoused. Yeah, like, they go, yeah. I didn't know it worked like that. Yeah. I didn't realize that. You know, that's not quite how they explained it to me, you know? And then you just realize, well, it's because they pay so much more commission for those policies and then they, they do term. Like in the industry, there's a saying, if you sell cash, you know, if you sell term, you can't eat. If you sell cash value, you can't sleep. Wow, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. I heard a really cool analogy recently because I got into options trading like a, a year or two ago when I was or I was doing like the wheel strategy, like selling and stuff. And um, somebody brought up how uh, all all life insurance is, I think, like like for for for, for whole life term or for the other one, um, whenever uh, it's basically like a, a lot or like an option that's based off somebody's life 
like like how long they live but it's, it's like an option contract yeah. it's basically an option contract but it's based off somebody's life term yeah. and it's like i when you look at it that way you're like holy shit this is crazy yeah. it's just a whole nother way of like how people kind yeah. of do things in the same shit well what you said a second ago is is i mean you you were you were right on right there with talking about you know i'm becoming self-insured everybody should be becoming self-insured like that's the whole reason term insurance like that's y'all's like, goal with y'all yes. too right yeah yes life insurance was never meant to be a permanent need it was always meant to be temporary it bridged the gap from i have i'm young i have a young family i just got a mortgage like i have my highest level of liability right now but i'm just starting out so i have my lowest level of assets if yep. something happens to me right now it's very consequential but give it a little bit of time kids grow up and eventually they get jobs and move out of the house, hopefully, right? You know, mm -hmm. that's kind of the general idea of parenting. Eventually your mortgage <laughs> is paid down. You know, your, your student loans, you know, all your debt are paid off, all that stuff. So over time, your liabilities begin to go down. And all the while you've been saving assets, 401ks, IRAs, all those things like that, mm -hmm. you know? And so if something happens to you, let's say when you're 55, 60 years old, kids are grown, they got their own jobs, house paid off, got $2.5 $2. million in my 401k, my IRA. Financially, mom's okay. Everybody's all right. You know, but early on it can be catastrophic. And mm -hmm. so that's what term insurance, pr you know, provides that it protects you. For just in you case. Yeah. Just in case. And Literally what insurance is for. <laughs> yes. That's the whole point, you know. And so what, what insurance is, is a, it's all it is, is a transfer of risk between you and the insurance company. Uh -huh. Say, look, I'm going to give you guys a hundred bucks a month or whatever it is. And you guys take the risk of me, of what would happen of me dying. You know, so it, all it is is saying, hey, in 20 years, I know I'll be okay. But before then... You know, if something happens, I'm in trouble. So that risk of dying early, you're transferring to the insurance company for the premium of 100, 200 bucks a month or whatever it is, you know. And mm -hmm. so it's just it's just smart. But again, just like everything, people try and figure out ways, hey, we can make more money if we twist it like this. And so it's all these yeah. little deceptive truths that they put so around. Another it. thing that all those other life insurance guys always say, like one of their big selling points I see on videos every day is um, – is that businesses, millionaires, big businesses, yeah. billion dollar companies, they use these policies. They use these big life insurance policies and stuff. Mm -hmm. Is that true or is this bullshit? I mean, this is one of those things may. that I hear a lot, <laughs> but I've, I've never seen proof of it. Like, you know, they may. I mean, and there's there's but I just I don't mean, see the incentive for even no, them to do it. No, 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 no. Once you understand really how the contract works. Like it's, it's just silly. It's like, well, that is the most inefficient way to do whatever they're telling, whatever they're saying. Yeah. And because so, even businesses can have their own 401 or yeah. savings, you and know? Our, so it's like, I don't even understand why they would. Yeah. And Armosi said this, like, you know, you'll see all those videos of like the, the secrets, to wealth that the rich don't want you to know and things like that. And it's like, listen, every rich person I know, like yells the secrets from the rooftop. You know what I'm saying? Meaning, yeah, like, but know, the dummies don't listen. So like, no, it doesn't matter. Listens, you know, 90% of people <laughs> won't listen anyway. Yeah, it's know. like, they don't have a secret. Like the secret is like, Hey, I mean, it's, it's, it's all very you know. simple at the end of the day. Like it's about who, you know, not what you know. Yeah. And then like, even when it gets into like property buying, which is what every millionaire is trying to, you know, 90% of millionaires, I'm pretty sure are property owners. If, if I look at the stat correctly and like, so everybody's trying to get into that. And even then that's not like rich dad, poor dad. That's like, the, you only have to read like one book probably to like really understand like the yeah. whole house, how to do the housing correctly, you know, how to like make sure to do everything because you know, he locks, there's, there's a few little things you need to learn about. And like, once you got it all done, you're kind of like, all right, I'm good now. You might need to learn a little bit more about how to structure the businesses, like with the umbrella corp or doing something like a different way to like make sure the taxes are the most efficient or like if you have a lot of money, maybe setting up a trust. But, you know, like there's yep. it's really not rocket science, I think, to get to the level of where some of the millionaires. Are. Now, if you want to start doing multiple umbrella corporations and doing all types of crazy shit like what Trump did and stuff, that's a whole other story. You know, like that's yep. all types of other shit. But I mean, I don't think people will get into that level until you're making millions of dollars, you know, like insane yeah. amounts of money. Um, just Jerry asked, uh, he's one of my, one of my biggest viewers. He said, should I join Primerica? It's actually very ironic that you brought up Primerica, man. Well, uh, well, man, it's uh it's a great company and it gave me a start. The, the, what, what, and, and honestly, why I've stuck with Primerica also over these 16 years and not, you know, gone somewhere else is one. Um, they pay for your licensing which is a huge cost. So if you don't have, you know, 1500 bucks or whatever, they'll pay for your oh, wow, insurance that's a lot licenses. Of money. They'll pay for your securities license. You can even get a mortgage license. You can do, you know, whatever. So one, they pay for your licensing. There's no quotas, no mandatory office hours. You can work as little or you can use the license as much as you want. Um, the other thing uh, about it is that it's a really doable business. Like this is not complicated. Like it's mm -hmm. a, it's simple, repetitive. Everybody needs it. You know, I've, I've thought about this too. Like, you know, if this is, 
you know, I'll have people talk about real estate a lot of times. And I go, if I go into my phone and let's say I take a hundred contacts out of my phone, how many of them right now are looking to buy a house? Sell a house <laughs> right now, not many. Well, or, yeah. or at any point in time, maybe five, maybe yeah. ten out of a yeah. hundred. You know, then how many of them are going to actually qualify for the loan, and how many of them are going to follow through and actually do it with me versus one of the other ten million real estate agents? You know, that yeah, especially know, now, there's know. tons of them. Yeah. There's actually more registered real estate agents than there are houses listed in the United States. I That's so know. ridiculous. You know? And so, wow, I was like, versus if I pick up my phone and I go through a hundred contacts, how many of them that are grown adults have auto insurance? And probably would want to save money on it. Homeowners, if they have kids and a family that need life insurance, how many of them want to save for the future? How many of them need a will? You know, and so I was thinking just marketability mm -hmm. and the compensation is similar, you know, between the two. You know, I make five, ten thousand dollars working with one client sometimes, you know, or so whatever. And so, but the the you know, the the profit is the same. It's a lot more simple. You get it's paid a, within a week or two compared to yeah, a month later yeah, with, with the with the houses. Work. Yeah. <laughs> I can meet somebody on Zoom for 30 minutes and set up their stuff in the raw. Oh yeah. But you it, just do you know? zoom calls for, for insurance. That's yeah, crazy. That's it, all over the country, you know? And so we've exploded doing that. But, um, but so one, it's a, it's a really marketable business. It's really doable. And Primerica has got a great system. I also believe in Primerica's philosophy. We were talking about other companies out mm -hmm. there, um, that I just don't agree with their philosophy. And I've never, I've never been able to, and I, I mean, if you're a good person, you probably like this too, but the whole point is like, I, I could never sell something that I, to somebody else that I wouldn't sell to my mom or to my, or mm. I wouldn't own myself. Yeah. And so, and, and so, you know, I'll go through things with other insurance agencies or, you know, agents and stuff like that sometimes. And they're like, you know, well, yeah, I don't, I, you know, we, we do do those policies, but I don't, I don't sell them. I'm like, well, but your company offers them, you know? And mm -hmm. so the point is, it's like, so you, you're still in the same, like, I couldn't do that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like I wouldn't know, even offer trash yeah. because yeah, I'm exactly. not going to sell trash. Exactly. Yeah. You know? And so it's, it's, uh, you know, it's just one of those things that, that I would like to know. see what they actually encourage, like sit down with some of those people, like give them oh, like yeah. an appointment to see what they try to really pitch, you yeah. know? And if it's the one that's like the most dirty, you know, I would yeah. love to see. Well, there's, like, two, exactly. there's two things. I mean, I've, cause I found both either, either people, either people are ignorant or they're malicious. Sometimes they just don't know. They don't know all the differences. They just know what they got trained on, you know? And so then they, they, I mean, there's a lot of really good people selling the wrong things out there because they just, they don't, just know. don't know. They don't know. Um, and so wow. I always, I always talk about that. Like, and sometimes people I'll go through their policy with them or whatever. And then in the, in the clients kind of like, just like, man, I can't believe this, you know? And they'll go, well, here's the deal. Let me, let me go back and talk to my old agent and let me just ask him some questions. And, you know, they're basically like, look, I'm, I might stay there with him, you know, because, but now I know this, I'm going to go back and I go, here's the deal. You're welcome to do that. But there's only one of two things that happened right here. Either one and uh, either one is, and I hope this is it, that they're ignorant and they didn't know what they were doing and they put you in this and they, you know, had no clue what they were doing. Mm -hmm. All right. The good person just didn't know what they were doing mm -hmm. or second, they knew better. But they chose to do it anyways because they got paid a lot more. Yeah. So my question to you is this. Do you want somebody that's either ignorant or malicious having anything to do with your family's financial security? Exactly. You know? Boom. And so, you know, so that's Boom. the that's the the deal. And so uh that but anyways, back to back to Primerica. Yeah, it's uh it, Primerica gave me a shot, man. And it's it's changed my life in a big way. I also get equity. You know, I have a bunch of stock that they've given me just through growing my business. And, That's dope. You know, passive income. Yeah. And so it's a great opportunity. You know, uh, but like, what would you say is the biggest difference between Primerica and the other um, life insurance companies? Like, like what, like the like the thing that is the perfect divide, like really, yeah, defines the difference. I mean, definitely, Art Williams, the guy that founded the company, built it on buy term invested difference. Like they were the ones that broke off from the rest of the industry because the entire our rest of the industry is, you know, cash value life insurance, IUL, whole, whole life, all that stuff. And he, all the stuff that makes the know, most money. Right. You know, he broke off and was like, no, the whole industry is greedy. And Y'all are wrong. I don't care. I'm going to do what's right. Y'all yeah. are doing this. We're going this way. We may make less money on these policies, but this is the right thing for people. And they introduced the concept of term insurance in, in like broad-based blue chip mutual funds. So it's like, you know, the Roth IRAs, the 401ks, yeah. you know, just – you know, that, that is the, is the better option, you know, what they call split funding versus like the, the one. And so, um, so anyways, yeah, that's, uh, that's, 
the main difference. The second is, you know, we get ownership in our, you can qualify for ownership in your agency, meaning you can air it to your family, you can sell it to, an, you know, back to the company, whatever. When um, somebody swaps to y'all because their policy is bad, are they able to like, if they've invested a lot of money into another policy, do they get that back or do they lose it? Like, how does that usually work? Yeah, good question. So if they actually have cash value in their policy, you know, we can rescue what dollars they have in there. That's so, cool. Yeah. So they can, before prior to canceling it, withdraw all the cash that's out of it once they have whatever they can get out of it then they cancel right and then they can move that money and they can't hit them whatever. with the eight percent fee or whatever yeah, no. after that it's yeah. like screw y'all you can't, <laughs> yeah. can't get us yeah, i tell them i'm like don't tell them you're canceling it just tell them i want all the money out and oh and so you do have to do a whole thing or yeah, else they'll like, try to like finesse yeah, you even the policy more. gets canceled but it's gone you know oh wow yeah. wow so you do have to be smart about how you do it yeah. oh man this is the, the, I've learned so much today, man. Now I love, I love just how the founder of the company, he sounds just like me because I came on here on YouTube and I went the complete opposite direction of the entire group, regardless how much money I was going to make, because I knew that it was the right thing to do. I don't yeah. care what anybody else thinks. It's, yeah, it's sure. a matter of what's right and what's going to yeah. help people. So yeah, I love that. I love primary. I love that y'all do everything that way because that's exactly what I like to push on my show, man. Yeah. Um, uh, just to also talk about, you know, go back to like the, the Christianity thing. Um, do you like, 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 you know, like my channel is called purple pill pod. Uh, I I'm sure you've barely watched anything. Like, what do you, um, do you know what like the red pill space is online? Have you heard anything about that? Dude, honestly, prior to you, I was pretty ignorant on most of it. You yeah. know, like I, yeah. I'm not I always curious. say people living in the real world that have good normal lives. Don't pay attention to this shit because yeah. why are you on the internet? If you have a family, if you have a wife, if you have kids, yeah. if you you're not paying attention to the internet. You're living yeah. a good, normal life. Right. You don't have to worry about all the bullshit. Um, most of these, these these people in the red pill space or just online and stuff, they're they're very um, they're very usually isolated. It's a lot, it's a lot of men mm-hmm. who um, are virgins or incels, involuntary celibates, guys that can't get sex. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's kind of harder than ever right now because there's a there's like a thing going on because of online dating and stuff where a lot of women are kind of going up to just the top guys, like the most attractive men and stuff. Yeah. They're, they're kind of ignoring a lot of the bottom 70% sometimes, wow. um, yeah. especially the guys with normal jobs and stuff like that. Um, so because of that, like we see this huge influx of men coming into the red pill space and just looking for answers. You know, why, why did she cheat on me? Like, why, like, why, why, why does she love me? You know, like, like why like I have unconditional love. Why doesn't she have unconditional love for me? Like, um, even a lot of people in the Christian community, there's a lot of people even in the going, like a lot of churches are leaving men stranded sometimes. Yeah. Um, a lot of bad things going happening to them and they're just saying, you know, it's your fault or, you know, it's probably something that you did or something. And sometimes it's the women. There's a lot of things that, uh, women have a lot of power over today because of feminism, um, because just, uh, you know, birth control, all these things that have came over the last, you know, 50, 60 years, it, it's made it to where everything is super unfair. 67% of college graduates are women. Um, a majority of, uh, uh, high earners in major cities are women now. Yeah. Um, you know, so when we look at all this stuff, we, we, we understand like there's a huge disportion of men that are like super lonely, super sad. Um, you know, just, uh, hate it. But so the, the, like the sad part about it to me is that we have feminism on the opposite side of red pill, which is women who sometimes go through trauma, go through bad things, maybe bad fathers, maybe didn't have a father, you know, something. And they hate men like they're, they're they want women to have more power. They want women to have this. Um, and another big, big, big difference between two is feminism preaches a lot that um, like the environment. It, and I believe this a lot. The environment is your destiny, you know, like like whatever. um uh, like if you're, if you're raised, if I was born in, in India, I would have been a Hindu, you know, like, mm-hmm. like you're, you're, inv- so like what they'll believe is, well, women can be anything. It, a woman can be an amazing football player. If we put them into a society that says women can be good football players or something, you know, like, like they, they believe everything is based off the environment and the patriarchy is the reason why everything is wrong. It's the environment that's causing all this. Whereas like, if we look at the red pill space, it's more, they're all the guys are saying, this is how we're wired. We want to do these things and y'all are wired this way. And that's why y'all do that this yeah. we're hardwired these ways but the truth is nuanced the mm-hmm. truth is purple the yep. truth is in the middle yep. so like, like, like the truth is that yes we like like their intelligence side the intelligent population can change certain things but we have a lot of people that are still move around like monkeys like we're still animals like we were for uh you know 1.1 million years we look at homo erectus you know and like when, when we look at all that it goes to show that we're like, we're going to act kind of within the statistical bounds of certain things because not everybody is intelligent, you know? And it's just, 
it, that's how I'm right here in the middle of this space because like I hate feminism and I hate the far it's like being against the far right and the far left. And I just think the powers that be want this because in politics, you know, Democrats versus Republicans, you know, racism, black versus white, um, financial one percent versus the ninety nine percent and then sex men versus women. And if we solve the men versus women problem, it's like it's the start of all of it because the nuclear family is the thing that fixes everything. So if yeah. we fix men and women, we fix all the other issues. Yeah. Another thing that I'm like really crazy about with the red pill stuff is that um, like changing the law. I'm the only guy online who talks about changing the laws because guys are scared to get married today. Like they're because the there's a 70 percent divorce rate, 90 percent if they're, she's college educated. Um, so guys are just dead set on oh, I'll never want to get married or they're yeah. just so scared. They're fear mongered out of it by a lot of these channels and stuff. And, and that's another. I want to get in there and change the laws. Like, like I have a politician in our mentoring program because we're trying to get more guys into politics, onto city boards, onto things. So then they can be in politics in 10 to 15 years, you know, start their their, their, their things now because there's no guys that are masculine that want to go and change things to make it to where things are more fair so men would want to get married again um, yeah this is just like a big like spiel on you know like red, kind of red pill is like what do you think after hearing all this like like where do you kind of see yourself like what do you think about all of it if you've never even seen kind of this drama that goes on online yeah well <laughs> man uh, I may not have seen a lot of the drama but I get the so much of it being relevant in our culture you know and you know we have seen such a shift it seems like you know, even just in our, you know, our lifetimes, it seems like there's just so much of a pivot right now. Oh, so, yeah, fast. And, um, and so I think part of it uh, is a few different things. Like we, you know, first off, if you just look like evolutionary in our existence, like we have never had an easier time in life than there is right now. Privileged like as hell. Instant food, instant everything. There's no longer dopamine on our phone. Our yes. I mean, it's just it. we are in these like really new, weird like types of lives you know what i mean whereas if you if you go back like back it wasn't long ago we were having to hunt food we were having to like work you raise the kids i'm doing this like it's like constant you know, work on both was, sides yes it was yeah. just like a totally different lifestyle like you know and so i think the role for a man you know historically was protect provide you know uh, it, you know fight you know whatever, whatever create be. create men, yeah. men, men's value comes from what we create yes yeah 100 percent. and then women you know by nature were nurturing they had you know i mean just there was a lot they of, create lots life of because we can't create life they yeah. do yeah. yeah and so this new modern era i think frankly we're all having to navigate and figure out because there's a lot of opportunities that women have now where they're like hey i could i could be a doctor too or hey i can go provide for myself too and all that's fair yeah. and if there's ambitious women that you know that are out there that you know have that more power to them i have two daughters i want them to go do and be happy and do yep. whatever they want to do but i do think we have to also look like at structure at roles at things like that we kind of live in this postmodern society where well truth is relative you know and i make my own truth right and well it's also you about know. not you don't want to hurt other people too like very pc world where um it's very scary like you're everybody's stepping on eggshells today like yeah. like like there's a lot of things that you can get canceled for and you don't want oh, to yeah. talk against certain people yeah. and things there's and there's a movement being pushed to back about it like i say a lot of words on my show and say a lot of things that we're fine 15, 20 years ago, but we would think today I can't say it, but yeah. shit, I've said it a few times and like, I today still haven't got actually, canceled yet. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't care. And it's like, and it's because we are pushing back. I think everybody makes fun of me online and says that the pendulum is not swinging back and stuff, but they're, 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 they're wrong. And like, it has happened before. Like, um, it's, it's called the, uh, Oh, what is it called? Uh, the, the, the Overton window and like, mm -hmm. well, like the Overton window always swings left. And like, but, but the thing is there has been times where it's gone back, right. Like, um, in Iran, I think, yeah, it was, I think it was Iran in the eighties or something like that, where like they went super liberal, but then they went back very conservative. So, yeah. but usually it all, the Overton window always goes to the left and we always end up shifting more to the left. But I, I, th I see this being another Iran period where we, we went too hard liberal. And I think the pendulum is going to go back super conservative and, yeah. and at least in America. And the reason why I believe it's going to happen is because it has to happen. Yes. I think it's either that or America's going down. Yeah. It's either it goes back this way or we're, we're all screwed. And China's yeah. going to end up owning us soon with all their TikTok bots and stuff. Like yeah. I'm sure you've seen what they teach the kids there and what, and what oh, they push 100%. here, you know? Yeah. So it's like, we know that they're, they're yeah. massively using psychological warfare against us. And it's like, we're either going to lose a war in the next five to 10 years against them yeah. or something, or 
or or we're gonna take over everything and like everything's gonna be good. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong and we're never actually gonna fix this shit. I don't know. I'm too optimistic. Well, I'm, I'm, Everybody I'm calls hopeful. me optimistic. I'm, I'm hopeful, man. Like, well, because honestly, we have we kids have to. too. Yes. We have kids, so we're gonna do whatever yeah. it takes. And that's what bothers me the most about these red pill spaces. A lot of these people will never have wives or never have girlfriends or never have kids because nobody likes them or like when they yeah. act this way. And of course, they're never gonna have this feeling about the future. Mm -hmm. You don't have nothing to re you don't have nothing to worry about the future. You know, like if you had a family, if you had kids, you would be worried about the future. You'd yeah. be planting trees now that would affect later on. 100%. But a lot of these people, they're they're getting into these hedonistic cycles where they're never gonna get to that point. Yeah, it, it's really scary, man. Like I don't know, yeah. it's really scary when we look at it like on paper and we see how divided everything is. Do you know what the percentage is of men from eighteen to thirty that are sexless right now? No. 33 percent man wow one third are virgins and or haven't had sex in the last year wow 33 percent yeah yeah it, well we have it we have a society where just like we were saying a second ago men men aren't challenged every day you know to the degree where they they had to you know fight take responsibility all that we have a very soft we get privileged right now you know? privileged dudes yes. We privileged and sedentary and everything else. And it's, you know, I think that even the women, like they complain about house chores, but like they, they have dishwashers now, you know? Right. Right. <laughs> but, you know, I've, I've talked with, you know, um, you know, guys, guys in the past, they're like, man, how, you know, how can I get a legit girl or like what, you know, or, Hey, how do I find the, the one right? Or But, you know, how do I find somebody that's awesome? That's beautiful. And, you know, has all the has things, all the, all the all buckets, the boxes, right. Yeah. You know? And, you know, this is not like, you know, that revolutionary of advice, but I always would say, listen, you have to become the man that that type of chick is going to be attracted to. If you don't have your crap together, why is she going to be attracted to you? If you don't, you know, if, if you're not have good habits, if your values aren't there, if your if your routines and all those things are, are out of whack, you know, why, 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 why would she, she want to be with why you? Why would she, why would she be attracted to you? And, you know, so many guys think it's like, well, if I, my muscles were bigger, or if I was just taller and it's like, yeah, there's more, there's maybe. more, but you got to have all the, but or some of them all full, you yeah. know, you can't just have one or the other. I call the guys who only have the muscles gym cells because yeah. they be, they, they go to the gym all the time, but they're still inside. that like, they still can't get sex. Like if no. you're weird socially, you're just still weird socially, yeah, man. That doesn't have a lot to do with it. There's a, yeah. there's guys that, you know, on the outside, they're not that attractive, but they're very popular. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, yeah. And the reality is because it's in here, you know, and, mm. and it's in here and your confidence and those things, but you only get confidence like true self-confidence from doing tough things experience from, from feeling good about yourself, you know? And so, you know, no, there's no, like, there's no microwave way to become a stud, you know? There's and that's no what they're way. selling online though. Now there's yeah. a lot of guys selling this microwave and like, that's the whole point of my course and everything is like, Nope, you're going in the real world, buddy. You don't get to sit on your phone. Anybody wants to yes. sign up for my shit. Y'all don't get to sit on your phone for my shit guys. Y'all, yeah. y'all got to be stepping. Yeah. Because I, I don't I don't I don't believe in that. I believe yeah. in experience and I believe that's what makes you above everybody else is the experience that you get have comfortable above. being uncomfortable. Yeah. Right? And that stretches your comfort zone. Like what is a comfort zone? I behave and think and act in this circle and mm -hmm. I'm comfortable doing it because I've always done it. Mm -hmm. Well, if I step out of that comfort zone, I don't like it. It doesn't feel very good, mm -hmm. but it's necessary to expand my comfort zone. And if you continue to put yourself out there and step out of your comfort zone and you keep stretching that comfort zone, then pretty soon you're going to be doing legit things routinely and you're comfortable doing them, you know, and whether that's talking to a girl, whether it's, you know, working out, whether it's working on yourself, whatever it may be, you know, you got to break those old habits and those thoughts and, you know, what, you know, and quit avoiding discomfort and challenges and differences and pursue them, you know, mm -hmm. you know. No, and then like for, for, for guys, one of the biggest things that I get on, to, like a lot of the girls that come on my show, I'm kind of hardcore on my show sometimes, man. Like I go in on these girls, but it's because like my biggest selling point is two things, okay? I think the guys are horrible today. There's a reason why 33% of men aren't having sex because they suck. Yeah. Like they, they need to pick, the, they, need, they need to pull themselves up by the bootstraps and do some shit because like you're judged based off of what you create as a man. Like your yeah. value is based off those things. We're privileged than ever. Like you were saying, you have to try harder than ever to be a, a, a good man, you know, yeah. um, to be a, va a man of value, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I talk shit on the men a lot because a lot of the women sometimes are like, well, what about the men? What about men? I think men are shit today and I think they need to be doing a lot of stuff. But I also tell the women, they have to keep their legs closed because if they stop having sex, if they stop giving it out for cheap, you know, a cheap, if it's a cheap commodity, yeah. then the men don't have to do anything. The, the, the like the six, four chads, as we say, they don't, they don't have to get their life together. They can still live at their mom's house and still get pussy. Like they're still going to yeah. get girls. Right. So why is he going to become a good man? So y'all, yeah. if y'all stop this, 
then they have to be forced to become better, you know? And so, like, that's another big part of my show is I, I tell the women, stop sleeping around. Like, stop having sex. Like, make yeah. these guys wait because that's what's going to make men in return better to make our society in return better. I always yeah. go back to Adam and Eve, and I, I have a very – um, a very like hard belief on this. And a lot of people like don't like it when I say these things, but I very much strongly believe the entire point of the story, the entire point of the whole story is that when, a, when, when the women fall to temptation, we all fall out of discord with nature. We all do. Men and women both fall when women fall. If a woman goes and bites the apple, if she falls for the temptation, if she does it, we're all screwed. And that's why she was the one that bit the apple. It wasn't Adam buying it. It's the woman that does. Because if she falls temptation, she start, if she opens her legs, if she starts doing that, then it starts a hedonistic cycle where everybody, even the men are going to be messed up too after that. Yeah. Because they, because they were supposed to work hard to get that. Yeah. They were supposed to, they, they, they should not have got it that easily. Right. It, we're we're going to fall out of discord. And I think a lot of the problems today all goes back to that one thing. That one little cycle of life that's just messed up. And people thousands of years ago realized this. They realized thousands of years ago we were animals. And this is one of the best ways to pull us out of that animal instincts that, that we have and, yeah. and closer to God, and, 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 and which is true nature in my eyes. And and that, the only way we're going to get to that is by, you know, women keeping their legs closed. It's messed up, yeah. but it's just what I believe. <laughs> no, I get it, man. And and I think worldview has a lot to do with with these things making sense, right? Because, you know, I think you and I share the same similar belief that it's like a nuclear family, in my opinion, is the best environment to raise humans in, yes. healthy humans, 100%. you know, where I've got, if, if I'm a, if I'm a, like a, you know, if I'm a kid, you know, and a guy, I've got my dad who's investing in me and giving me things. And then I've got my mom investing in me and maybe I've got siblings, but I've got two loving parents. Like my wife and I right now, we have a, you know, a new baby boy. He's seven months old. Congratulations. Yeah. Cute little dude. He's a, so much fun, man. We're having a blast. But even this morning, like he woke up and we were both there and, you know, and he wakes up and he's like looking around and we both just are sitting there laying on the bed, playing with him. And he's just smiling and cackling. And it's like, we were both were like, he's so loved. Like he showered in healthy love all day, every day. My wife, thankfully we're fortunate and blessed. She doesn't have to work and she just hangs out with him all the time. And she kills it by the way. It is such, let me tell you, being a mom, breastfeeding, like <laughs> waking up at night, like she has been beasting it. And I have been doing like, not a lot of it, but you know, and so she's, <laughs> She's killing it, but I'm seeing it in these kids, man. I'm seeing these like healthy, happy, well-rounded kids that are confident in like coming out in life. Um, and, and it's because of the nuclear family. They have so much support. The the environment mm. that they're grown, they're they're raised in. There's no deficiencies in life from you know whatever it is. And I'm not casting judgment on anybody. I'm just saying from my objective reality, I'm looking and saying this is a really healthy place to, to raise healthy humans mentally, mm -hmm. physically and everything else. Right. Socially, you know, and gives them confidence and they're most equipped to go out in the world. You know, a lot of times now you see a lot of other situations where maybe single parent, whatever the kid was tough and they had to step up and all that. And there's a lot of positives that come from all these different situations. But like, if you could draw up like, Hey, what's, what's the best scenario? It's a nuclear family. Well, what's the core of a nuclear family? It's two people in love committed, you know, to each other long term and commit to the family, committed to each other and the family. Right. Yeah. You know, and like they say, the uh, kids, the, you know, kids, number one are in, in love. Right. First off, yes, they need to know that, that you love them. But where they get their security from is not knowing that you as the parent love them. They get their security from knowing that you as the parents love each other. Like that's first. Second, they get their security from you loving them. They get their personal security in life way much more from knowing my parents love each other and they're not going anywhere, you know? And, I never thought about that, and, but it's so yeah. true. So they, that's why divorce kids from divorced families can feel so separated sometimes. Yeah. And probably in, you know, and probably in situations where they're not as secure in life because the, the people that protect them, you know, they couldn't even hold it together. They couldn't keep it together. So now it's like, well, my environment's maybe even a little less secure, you know, and I'm, again, I'm, not casting any judgment here. This is, Hey, it's just, okay. This whatever. is a judgment. You're yeah, allowed yeah, to cast I, judgment on this channel, buddy. Right. <laughs> <Gotcha>. <laughs> no, I, I believe Jesus said judgment was okay. Just don't be a hypocrite if I remember yeah, it correctly. Yeah, right. Isn't go. that what he right. said? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, so if we, if we go to the core of that, which is a, a, a relationship between two people committed, right. There's, that's the core of marriage and everything else. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, lifestyles leading up, like it, why would I want to marry this person? Why would this person want to marry me? You know? And when we start getting farther and farther away from that long-term commitment to people out there and it becomes like, well, we were together for six months and then, you know, 
you know, kind of got old, got whatever. Now I switched to somebody else. And we kind of have these like, you know, this lifestyle where instead of being connected and deep, we live, we're like an inch deep and a mile wide in our relationships in life, mm-hmm. you know, and there's no depth to one person that you built a life with, you know, and, and they have a lot of little things with a lot, yeah, of, little a lot of little difference. Well, of course I'm going to conduct myself different. Of course I'm going to just, you know, whatever, like even on like dating apps, like I uh, actually, I think on a Rogan podcast, I heard the story about this guy that literally, you know, this chick was like, yeah, we met on a dating app. We hooked up that night. And then literally like, right after they hooked up, he just go, he's on his phone and then he's right back on Tinder, like, or whatever, whatever he was doing, just going to the next one. It was just like, you know, and, and I've been out of the dating scene, you know, and I've never been on a dating app or anything like that, but, but the point I mean is, either. <laughs> so, but the point is, it's like, man, that's, you're, you're getting a, a really like artificial version of, of love and you get an artificial version of depth and meaning. Mm-hmm. How do you get meaning? You get meaning from doing something that's tough and making an investment into something like mm-hmm. that's meaning, you know? And so like doing something really, really hard and going through something hard gives you depth and meaning. Like marriage is hard, like relationships, long-term are hard. Serving somebody long-term is hard. And whenever you do tough stuff, you get more meaning, you know, and you get like, more back. Like I, I do this uh, talk when I go speak places about Michael Jordan, it's called the champion muscle. Right. And it's, uh, it's on, uh, you know, him in the picture is him holding that trophy, that NBA championship trophy balling. You know, it's the first time they won an NBA championship. He's sitting on the floor holding this golden basketball trophy balling, right? And he was known as a hard ass, right? Like Michael Jordan was known as a tough teammate. He, you know, he was not a softy. He was not like all feely willy, whatever. You know, he was yeah. like, he was a tough He's a hardcore dude. guy, yeah. Mentally, he was, tough, he was tough to be friends with. Man. Yeah, like he, he's mean. He was a jackass, you yeah. know I mean? He was a jerk, you know, a lot of times. And so- what made this freaking tough like dude sit on the floor and ball holding that basketball? Like what made it, what made it happen? It wasn't that he all his life, he just wanted this little shiny golden basketball. It, it, even the NBA championship, what did the NBA championship represent? It represented back his whole life when he'd been discredited in high school, when he had to work through injuries, when he had been doubted, when he had to push harder, when he had to carry the weight of, you know, well, you're this great superstar rookie. Can you actually deliver it? Like he had to carry so much and invest so much and get through so much that when the moment was realized, the, the emotion was overwhelming. And he couldn't, and he couldn't, like it overwhelmed him. And there was so much meaning and depth there. And so I want to live my life doing things that make me cry when it's all realized. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like at the end of my journey, like even you doing what you're doing here, it's tough, dude. You've, you know, you've made investments into your business. You're working hard. You're doing connections. You're growing. Obviously things are awesome, but I know there's a lot of challenges along the way. You know, yeah. same with me. I look at my business and I go, man, I used to be terrible. I was broke. I was this, I was that. And I look back at the journey, but now when things, you know, are celebrated or they're accomplished, I cry. Dude, I cry so, yeah. <laughs> so frequently. Dude, now. I think that's something from the church, yeah. man. It's fucking, it, it made kids. me the same way, bro. It made it to where I, yeah, I have no, I have no fear of it either. And I yeah. talk about, I'm one of the very few guys in this space that will talk about these type of things because you're shamed yeah. for, for, for crying in this space. So yeah. Like we, we have to teach men not to show it to every woman because every woman's not uh, like, I can't do it. I have to teach men that you have to earn the ability to cry. Yeah. Because if, if you're making thirty thousand dollars a year and you're crying about not being able to make the car payment, then she might leave you over that. Yeah. Because you're you know, it's like it looks really bad, man. Like yeah. you need to figure out the problem yeah, and stop yeah, crying about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or or do it on your own or go like we have to teach men to like go to other men for things. But men don't like crying with other men. That's something yeah. that we learned in the church that wasn't that big of a deal. But a lot of men today don't do that. They don't have a man that they can go and do that to. I think people like one of my favorite verses is Jesus wept. Like, and it's because I believe that he was one of the strongest men to ever walk this earth. And he was able to cry. Like, yeah. and it's just like, people really yeah. don't like, like there's sometimes verses have a lot of me. It's a short thing, but it has a lot of meaning to yeah. it. And like, yeah. uh, like people look past it. Yeah. I cry, dude. I, I maybe having kids, maybe some of the stuff I've gone through in life. I don't know what it is, but dude, I'll cry all the time, but it's yeah. not over like, pain it's over like meaningful things yeah like you know or like or like like, like the kid with cerebral palsy like getting in the basketball game and making a shot yeah. you know like you see those videos like you can't hold yeah. that shit back like or some yeah. kid pushing through like overcoming fear or an injury or something and pushing through like that tough stuff i love when yeah people push through it's a, it's, tough stuff, yeah it's, it's actually a very masculine uh, uh crying guys it's nothing yeah, wrong with it's, it it's at tough, all tough guy crying uh <laughs> what what dylan dylan mulvaney is a high value man changed my mind no he's not get out of here jerry yes he is though you guys man this is a very very close friend of mine I, dude this was actually i gotta say 
of all like the little like interviews and discussions I've had with people I've had on the show, this was by far my favorite. And it's just because of the history that we have yeah. you know, with the church. Uh, we, I, I, I can't believe how much people who went through what we went through were, were probably very, all very similar minded. Like I need to talk to more of the other people from, from back then. Cause I, I, yeah. I would almost guarantee we probably see all see eye to eye on like a lot of things just because of how we mm-hmm. learned, like, like everything about that place was just, it was a whole, like the, the spirit yeah. of Christ was in that shit for, for real. Like there, God was in that place moving people for real, because it's still all moving through all of our souls today. I always like to, you know, I call my po- podcast sometimes like a secular Christian podcast because I'm scared of like claiming like, 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 like Christianity and it being judged because of me. Like I, because I'm still going to cuss. I'm still going to do a lot of like things that people don't like. And I don't want Christianity to be judged for that. And at the same time, if somebody's a is a Muslim or somebody's a Hindu or somebody's a Buddhist or something, I don't want them to judge me based off the Christian name when I bring them to Christ. I feel like I can still be I can still bring people to Christ without calling myself a Christian, if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know why. I just think that I can. And 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 I, and I just I also just see God and Christianity as something just bigger than 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 a label than a name. It's yeah. it's like it's it's nature. It's it's science. Like even the greatest scientists of all of history were Christians. Mm-hmm. So and their and their pursuit. And science and learning about the universe was through God and through Christ. Like that's why they did it. Yeah. Some of the greatest of all time. Yeah. Um, and so I, I really believe like science, nature, um, God, like I think it's all the same thing. And people just get confused and, and the devil made it different words to confuse us, you know. Yeah. Well, um, man, I think people are starving for authenticity. Yeah. You know, and I, I mean we know that we hear that, but you know, in all reality, you got to be you, you know, because I think whenever you're you and you're truly authentic, your energy is just different. It's not that they're like, oh, I feel like I can relate. Like the the words and the image and all that stuff, are, there's an energy that's conveyed when you can tell somebody's just authentic, you know, that, that, that happens. And so I think that, you know, just you being you and be, you can be the most convicted and you're in the most self and you're passionate, obviously, about the things that you talk about and you feel like you're bringing value in, in, in you know, bring value to the world and to men and other people that are out there. And you got to be authentic to that because that's what makes people go, I feel like I can trust that guy. Yeah. You know, because people, they like you first, they trust you second, and then they'll follow you, right? You know, and so it's like, you know, I like you. I like the energy. The authenticity makes me go, I feel like I can I can trust that guy, you know, mm-hmm. and then that's when they follow. And then you they know? follow, yeah. No, uh, it's just, that's why it all goes back to like the thing that I said. If I can get panels of women three nights a week, and I can teach them if like, if you help me bring some Christian women on sometime or something yeah. and we it helped me teach these women that, that are living in hedonism or just living in bad cycles, you know, teach yeah. them to, you know, keep their legs closed, do these things. Slowly, we fix the world by doing that in my eyes. If, it, if it's all based on the cycle that I believe in my head, then we fix the whole world by doing that. Also yelling at men the whole time, telling them that they ain't shit and they need to get their shit together because yeah, like, obviously we can't sit there and blame one side. Like you have to blame both sides, but yeah. it's just a little bit different. Yeah, I think so much of it's just everybody's got to step up man like that's everybody has got to step up women got to step up but it all it all is you have to begin like stephen covey says you begin every journey with the end in mind right you know if i someday want a solid marriage with a man that respects me or a woman that respects me you know and loves me and wants to serve me and pursue me i have to conduct myself prior to that in a way that's respectable and in a way that i'm still valuable like Mm -hmm. you know nobody wants to be with somebody that you know you reap what you sow. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's that's lived a life of like, you know, not valuing themselves and not thinking about that what that future relationship was going to be like, and the, you know, and all that. And so, uh, you know, my wife probably ain't gonna like me if I've had a hundred girlfriends before that. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, and she's just like, oh, so you finally settled on me whenever you're ready to grow up? Like, you know that? It's like, no, I I saved a lot of my value and my heart and my love and all my date ideas and all these other things like that for somebody that I really wanted to pour my life into, you know, yeah, and to make it special and to not just special. another thing that yes. everybody has today. Yes. Yeah. You know, special. It's amazing, so. bro. No, thank you so much for coming, man. I, I really appreciate you for coming. Like I said, this was probably like my favorite interview just because it was so personable. Yeah. We got to really deep, like dig a little bit deeper with Christianity and stuff. Um, I don't usually get to tell people about Red Pill and what, like what my show is about. So it was really yeah. cool just getting to do all that, man. Thank you so much for coming though. I really hope that you can come on again and yeah, teach these to, people man. about investments because obviously people need help in the investments thing sure. and they're getting misled bad. And I see yeah. this every day online especially with the life insurance those other companies that we were talking about oh yeah it's fucking bad right now bro yeah, yeah, yeah. so i would love to do more episodes with you again man yeah. i really appreciate you thank you it. chat uh the, uh just jerry ramar thank you all for coming guys anybody else that watches this please like the video on y'all's way in 
please set up y'all's notification bells so y'all can see the show for now on uh, because I know it turned it off for a lot of y'all. Um, anybody, if you want to show support, hit that join button. If you need your media help, hit me up and I'll set up a media package for y'all to for your YouTube channels. Um, but yeah, thank you, bro. Why don't you shout out your um, – do you have an Instagram really quick so they can come find you and message you if they need to? Yeah, it's uh, Chris Shepard 77 I think, on Instagram. And then I'm on TikTok, uh, Chris Shepard NSD. And then I'm on Facebook too, just my name also. But I'm just kind of getting out. started on all those places, so I'm – excited yeah, so yeah guys me. yeah we're okay. about to get him fully set up guys that's about to be really fun I, but no thank you so much bro this was one of my favorite shows but guys we will see y'all um what's today sunday i'll see y'all tomorrow night i got a panel of ladies for y'all i'm pretty sure if everything works out and they don't bail on me so yeah i will see y'all tomorrow night guys peace out